Hey everyone. Okay, we're gonna jump right into chapter one. Chapter one, my work as a cult expert. Finally, a chance to relax, forget about work, and enjoy some social time with my friends. Maybe meet some new people at this party. Hi, my name is Steve Hassan. Nice to meet you. I just hope no one asks me to talk about work. The question, so what do you do? Oh no, not again. The dodge. I'm uh, self-employed. Doing what? No escape. I'm a cult expert. Here come the 50 questions. Oh, really? That's interesting. How did you get into that? Can you tell me why? Since February... Okay, I have to pause it right there. I've, I'm sure anyone else... I'm sure there's someone else out there that has the same feeling as I do. It's so awkward when something comes up and the only way to really explain whatever the situation is is to explain I grew up in a cult. And there's so often where I'm like, uh, um, because? And then someone will like ask another question or I just, sometimes I can get away without saying it and then other times I'm like, oh, fuck it. I grew up in a cult. That's why I don't do, 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 do. Or this is why I don't understand. Or this is why I'm technically four years old. I've only celebrated four birthdays and et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's nice to talk about sometimes. And then other times it's just exhausting. It's mentally exhausting because like Steve Hassan just said, here comes the 50 questions. It's just natural. People are curious. They want to know. But oh my god. Sometimes. It's just awkward. 1974. I have been involved with the problems caused by destructive cults. That was when I was recruited into the One World Crusade. One of hundreds of front groups of the Unification Church. Also known as the Moonies. After two and a half years as a member of that cult, I was deprogrammed after I fell asleep while driving a fundraising van and smashed into a tractor trailer truck at 80 miles an hour. Ever since then, I have been actively involved in fighting destructive cults. I've become a professionally trained therapist and fly anywhere my help is genuinely needed. My phone rings at all hours of the day. My clients are people who, for one reason or another, have been damaged emotionally, socially, and sometimes even physically by their involvement with destructive cults. I help these people recover and start their lives over. My approach enables them to make this transition in a way that avoids the trauma associated with the often illegal abduction method Ted Patrick called deprogramming. My work is intensive, totally involving me with a person and their family, sometimes for days at a time. My approach is legal and respectful. Usually, I am able to assist a person in making a dramatic recovery, accessing and reclaiming their authentic identity, or at least understanding that they have a better life ahead of them if they decide to leave the group. Only a handful of people in the world work with members of destructive cults. This book reveals most of the significant aspects of my approach to this unusual profession. This is work and a way of life that I never imagined. I undertook it because I thought I could help people. Having seen how destructive cults deliberately undermine basic human rights, I also became an activist. I'm especially concerned with everyone's right to know about how destructive cults recruit, keep control of, and exploit highly talented, productive people. So, right there. Um, you know, I'm not very good at regularly you doing doing my youtube and you know i i'm on facebook groups and and i have a facebook page you know specifically for um just putting out awareness of destructive cults i'm not like it's not my full it's not a full-time thing for me it's a it's a here and there every kind of, you know, kind of thing. But the reason I do it is the same reason Steve Hassan says, and I think a lot of people feel the same way. We want to help. And even if it's just one person or one subject, 
that, you know, maybe I have a hundred YouTube videos and only one video helps someone. Okay, well then that one video helps someone because when I started deprogramming, when I started having a clear mind of what happened and understanding what it was to be a Jehovah's Witness, honestly, it was YouTube and Reddit. And it was different videos across the board. It was some that went into the background and it explained um, the actu- the culture of certain societies. Um, I watched videos on different cults, on different religions. Uh, I watched then um, different videos on just emotions and what it's like to be shunned and to be disassociated, to be disfellowshipped, to have your family push you away, never talk to you again. Um, All of that really helped me to have a clear mind and understanding, and I could do it on my own terms. It wasn't someone else dictating what I could and could not watch. So I may not be very regular at it, but I'm still here, and I still love it, and I still enjoy it because... I think it's important. I think more people should come on. And even if you only do one video, do one video. Say how it feels. Maybe, you know, don't have the camera on. Just do a voiceover thing. I feel like as a community, there's so many of us that have been in the same situation. And thanks to the internet, we can finally all connect. It's a beautiful cause. Um... And he mentions having seen how destructive cults deliberately undermine basic human rights. He goes in further to discuss that throughout the book and what it means. But it's very true. Jehovah's Witnesses and other, I mean, Moonies, Scientology, you name it, Mormons. It's, it calls out many different uh, groups. And I only have experience, that's my cat, by the way, sorry. I only have experience in one. So when I talk in towards something, I'm going to speak towards what I have experience with. But anyways, yeah, I just, I just found that interesting. That's why I'm still here, and that's, I think more people should come on. So if you, or if you're scared, um, take a risk. Do one. See how it goes. The worst thing, you don't like it, you don't, you never have to do it again, right? My life as a cult expert often makes me feel as though I'm in the middle of a war zone. All kinds of incredible cases and media situations come my way, and I do the best I can to help. Even though I try to manage the number of active cases and see only a reasonable number of clients each week, unexpected emergencies sometimes command my attention. Here is one such story. I came home late one Friday evening after a night out with friends and checked my phone messages. There were four calls, all from the same family in Minnesota. Call us any time, day or night, please, said a woman's voice. Our son Bruce has gotten involved with the Moonies. He's going on a three-week workshop with them in Pennsylvania on Monday. He's a doctoral student in physics at MIT. Please call us back. I called right away and talked with the mother and father for about an hour. They had heard that their son had become a member of an organization called the Collegiate Association for the Research of Principles, C-A-R-P, or CARP. They had done some investigation and discovered that CARP was the international student recruiting arm of the Unification Church. I had started a branch of CARP on the Queens College campus, so I knew all about it. We agreed there was no time to lose. After some discussion, we decided on a course of action. They would take a 6.45 a.m. flight to Boston the next day. They would go to their son's apartment, take him out to a restaurant, and assess his situation. Their success or failure would depend on Bruce's close relationship to them and on how far the Moonies had already indoctrinated him. Had they gotten to the point where they could make him reject his family as satanic? His mother and father assured me they would be able to talk to their son. I wasn't so sure but agreed it would be well worth the attempt. From my experience with the Moonies, I felt that if Bruce went to the three-week indoctrination, 
he would most likely drop out of school and become a full-time member. The next step would be for the parents to persuade Bruce to talk to me. I was worried about whether they could. The Moonies do a very thorough job of convincing people that former members are satanic and that even being in their presence could be dangerous. I mentally review. I'm going to pause it right there. So, a couple things. Jehovah's Witnesses will say at the door they're not there to indoctrinate you. That's a lie. The whole purpose of their door-to-door -door ministry is to find those that have the, the seed planted within their heart to become a Jehovah's Witness. Basically what that means is that they go to every single door they can as many times as possible, hoping to find someone who will accept a Bible study. Then from there, the Bible study turns into meeting attendance. Meeting attendance turns into meeting participation. Meeting participation turns into a unbaptized publisher. And when you're an unbaptized publisher, it means you are a Jehovah's Witness. You are not officially baptized as a Jehovah's Witness, but you've made a, like, like a partial dedication kind of. You have verbally said, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, I'm a part of this congregation, I'm an unbaptized publisher. So when they say, oh, we're not here to indoctrinate people, false. They are there to indoctrinate people. Some are just better at it than others. Also, there's some that go door to door in ministry simply because they have to. Their heart really isn't in it. They don't care. They're just doing it so they can put hours down on their timesheets because there's timesheets. Believe me, when they're going door to door, writing letters, making phone calls, going to businesses, if they're there talking about, if they're preaching, they are counting those hours. And those hours get turned into the society. They get turned into the congregation. And then the con congregation takes all those hours and they funnel it up to the would-be head people. Okay, so anyways. um, So next, he goes into... Because uh, oh, because he had Moonies have a, a recruiting program, recruiting indoctrination, same thing. Satanic. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> he talks about uh, how they don't want. They view other people as satanic, and Jehovah's Witnesses do the same thing. As you slowly become indoctrinated. If you accept a Bible study and that Bible study is serious and regular and then you start meeting attendance, very quickly you're going to be uh, taught and told that you should limit your association with others outside of the organization. They very quickly want to pull you in and then separate you from anyone outside of the congregation. Because anyone outside of the congregation is under Satan's control. And their bad association. Really what it comes down to is that if you're in association with other people, there's a chance that you could be distracted and you won't become a Jehovah's Witness. Or you could lose your way and if you already are a Jehovah's Witness, you would fall out and no longer be one. That's the whole point. So, yeah, um... Jehovah's Witnesses love to say that they're not a cult and they're nothing like any of these other horrible programs and things like that. Well, I've never heard of the Moonies before this book and it's definitely a cult from what we read and see, but the similarities are there. So if Jehovah's Witnesses try to say there's nothing similar and there's nothing in common. False. Moving on. Viewed the possibilities. There were a number of ways things could go badly. Bruce could refuse to meet with me or meet with me and walk away before we had enough time. He could later tell the Moonies his parents asked him to meet with me, in which case he might be whisked away and given deep phobias about Satan working through his family. He would have come to believe what I believed while I was a Mooney. 
I was programmed to fear my family and cut off personal contact for over a year. For the moment then, all I could do was wait. The next morning, I was interviewed for a television show on cults, something I do frequently all over the country. After the taping, I canceled all my appointments for the day. Bruce's parents called from the Boston airport. They were about to leave for their son's house. We reviewed our strategy one more time. I crossed my fingers. Two hours later, the phone rang. They had managed to bring Bruce to a Chinese restaurant not far from my house. Bruce had agreed to meet with me. I grabbed whatever I thought I might need to show him. File folders, photocopies of articles and books, and threw them into the car and drove to the restaurant. When I arrived and met the family, the parents' faces were full of worry and concern. Bruce tried to smile at first and shook my hand, but it was clear to me that he was thinking, can I trust this guy? Who is he? I sat down in the booth with them. I asked Bruce about himself and why he thought his parents were so concerned that they flew from Minneapolis. Within an hour, after asking him enough questions to get a good handle on his state of mind, I decided to go for it. Did they tell you about the pledge service yet? I asked. He shook his head and looked surprised. What's that? Oh, that's a very important ceremony members do every Sunday morning, on the first day of every month, and on four holy days the group observes, I started. Members bow three times with their face touching the floor before an altar with Sun Myung Moon's picture on it and recite a six-point pledge to be faithful to God, to Moon, and to the fatherland, Korea. You're kidding! At that moment, I knew Bruce would be all right. I could see that he was not yet fully under the group's mind control. I thought he would respond well to hearing more information about the group's leader. Okay, I'm going to pause it right there. So... They do this whole bowing ceremony thing, whatever, which does sound a bit extreme, right? When you hear that, that's extreme. Jehovah's Witness does, they don't have any bowing ceremonies. They don't, I don't know, they don't do anything, I would say, crazy like that. But you are obligated. This is not an option. This is not a choice. When you're a Jehovah's Witness, you have to attend meetings. There are, it used to be meetings three days a week. They're now down to two. You have, uh, which I thought, I think maybe that's changing as well. Um, I need to, I've been out for a couple of years now, so I need, I need to look into that. But when I left, there was still two meetings. So you had your midweek meeting, which is an hour and a half, technically two hours long. And then you have your Sunday meeting, which is a public talk with the Watchtower lesson afterwards. Again, they say hour and a half-ish, but it's two hours. So then you have your door-to-door -door ministry, which you have to do a minimum every month. So they take the collective of the congregation and they average out and they say that's your minimum, right? So if your average congregation has, say it's eight to 15 hours a month, then every publisher is supposed to meet that minimum requirement, which means every publisher is required, this is not an option, you have to do some sort of preaching work for that minimum amount of hours. Eight hours, 10 hours, 15 hours, whatever it is. There are a few exceptions for the elderly and disabled, but if you are just your general member in good standing health, these are requirements. Okay, so you have your midweek meeting. Your They love to push for Saturday field service because most people work full time. So they pretty much expect all families to be out in service on Saturday. Then there's Sunday meetings. Then you have your assemblies, which you have your one-day assemblies. And I think they still have two-day assemblies. Then you have your public meeting or your... Um, you're, it's, it's like this big special talk they do once a year. And then you have the convention, which is a three-day convention, which you're required to go to. So, no, they're not bowing, but there are things you are required to do. Um, yeah, we'll move on. 
multimillionaire Korean industrialist, Sun Myung Moon. I began telling him facts about the Moonies unrelated to mind control, Moon's felony tax fraud conviction, the congressional report on the Moonies' connections to the Korean CIA, and their suspected illegal activities. You know, I've been looking for someone like you for a few months, Bruce said after hearing me out. Okay, hold on. I want to say so. So he just went into a little bit of the background, the the realistic, the real background of the of the head guy for Moonies, right? A lot of witnesses, me included, did not or do still do not know the true history of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, here's where the Jehovah's Witnesses like to control the narrative. They release their own video. And it's like a two, I think it's a two-part video. It's pretty long on uh, the light. There's something about the light, shining the light or the he, whatever. The point is, it's Jehovah's Witness published video on how the Jehovah's Witnesses came to be the Jehovah's Witnesses. They tell half-truths. It's the truth, but it's not the truth. Um, it's very interesting when I left, I didn't leave hating the Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, I left because I was mad. Don't get me wrong. But I wasn't out to tear them down or speak bad or anything like that. Right. And it was within, after I had a clear head and I was away from them, I started doing my own research. I started finding out all these things about the past about the history of the Jehovah's Witnesses that I never knew. They don't teach you. And it's because they want to control the narrative. So if you're only reading their literature, if you're only watching their videos, how do you really know you're getting the full story? Most likely, you're not getting the full story. Because they're purposefully going to leave out things that make them look bad. So keep that in mind. If you are in association with Jehovah's Witnesses right now, if you're talking to them, maybe you are a Jehovah's Witness, just do some digging, do some research outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses publications and videos. Go outside. They don't want you to. They tell you not to. They say it's bad. And then there's a reason they don't want you to. It's because you're going to find out the truth. The real truth. I went to the priest at MIT to ask him for information. And he didn't know anything. Bruce was still thinking for himself. But in my opinion, he had been on the verge of being inducted into the cult. The three-day and seven-day workshops he'd been through had set him up for the 21-day program. When I was a member, it was common practice after this latter program to ask recruits to donate their bank accounts, move into the Mooney house, and become full-time members. Bruce and I spent the next couple of days going over more information, watching videotapes, and talking about mind control and destructive cults. Much to his parents' relief, he finally announced he wasn't going to the workshop. He spent a lot of time photocopying stacks of documents and wanted to try to talk to the other students being recruited at MIT. He went back to the priest and told him about his close call. A week later, the priest called to see if I would conduct a briefing session for college administrators. That case was an easy one with a happy ending. The family had been quick to spot their son's personality changes, discover that Carp was a front for the Moonies, and locate me. Their fast action enabled them to help their son easily and quickly. The phone calls I receive are usually variations of the same plea for help. A son or daughter, sister or brother, husband or wife, mother or father, boyfriend or girlfriend is in trouble. Sometimes he or she is just being recruited. Other times the call is about someone who has been in the cult for many years. It is relatively easy to deal with someone not yet fully indoctrinated, like Bruce. Most people who call me, though, have had a longer-term problem. Some cases can be resolved quickly. Others require a slower, more methodical approach. Emergencies like Bruce's are tricky because there is little or no time to prepare. 
Nonetheless, I have learned that fast action is often necessary. If someone is being worked on in a mind control environment, sometimes even a few hours can be crucial. For some unknown reason, the calls for help seem to come in waves. Only a few a day for a while, then suddenly 10 or 15 calls. Although I have traveled overseas to help people in cults, I spend most of my time traveling all over the United States and Canada. So, real quick, he mentions that for some unknown reason, the calls seem to come in waves. One possible reason I know for the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, again, I can only relate to an organization that I've personally been a part of. Um, the organization makes pushes for uh, field service during certain times of the year. So right around the convention, they push out uh, invitation work. And people, Jehovah's Witnesses, they love invitation preaching because they don't actually have to preach. They don't actually have to pull out the literature or a Bible. All they have to do is give you an invitation. They love the invitation track work. They absolutely love it. And they get, um, they lower the amount of hours so that more publishers can become auxiliary pioneers for the month, et cetera, et cetera. It's a campaigning. They call it campaigns. So there's the convention campaign. There's the special talk campaign. There's the memorial campaign. And they push hard at these times for everyone to go out and field service and to talk to as many people as possible just to get an invitation in their hand. Um, so yeah, that could be one reason why it comes in waves is because there are certain times of year when you're going to have a flood of witnesses out everywhere. Canada. More than once in my travels, I have found myself on a train or plane sitting next to a dissatisfied member of a destructive cult. During the encounter, I have discovered that the person wanted more information about how to change his or her life. I freely offer this information. These mini-interventions can help plant a seed or actually turn on a light bulb of awareness, enabling the person to reclaim his or her personal autonomy. My work entails two parts, counseling individuals and alerting the public to the cult phenomenon. I believe that sensitizing the public to the problem of mind control or undue influence is the best way to counter the growth of these groups. It is fairly easy to advise people about what to watch out for. It is much harder and far more complicated to help someone leave a cult. That's why the best way to deal with this problem and damage done to people in destructive cults is to inoculate people through education about cult mind control particularly helping people learn how undue influence works. People's resistance is higher when they are aware of the danger. To this end, I give lectures and seminars and appear on television and radio shows wherever possible. And I write books, such as this one. Cults. Okay, we're going to pause it right there. So, wet cloth, please stop. That's my cat. My kitty. Um, okay. I'm going to end it because we're right at the 30 minute mark. So we're about halfway through the first chapter. But this last paragraph was huge for me. Um, alerting the public to the cult phenomenon. Phenom phenomenon. Phenomenon. <laughs> I believe that sensitizing the public to the problem of mind control or undue influence. He, he likes that phrase better than mind control. And I have to agree with him. I really like it. Undue influence is the best way to counter the growth of these groups. So let's be realistic. Most of my family, they're not going to leave. They're Jehovah's Witnesses. They've always been Jehovah's Witnesses. They're going to remain Jehovah's Witnesses. However, if I can help future generations become aware before they enter into these groups, that 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 would just be amazing. So I think it's important to have open conversations. It's also why as hard as it is for me to say I grew up in a cult and as as exhausting as it can be 
like I meant, I started out the video <laughs> laughing because you get into these awkward conversations where people are like, oh, well, why, why this or why that or I don't understand, blah, 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 blah. And I have to go, well, I grew up in a cult, you know, and, then, and I kind of like sh sh shy away from it. I'm trying to stop myself from shying away and I'm trying to be more confident in saying I grew up in a cult but I left and here's how here's why and I'm trying to you know summarize that down into just a few sentences knowing there's going to be 50 questions afterwards but you have to be, you don't have to. It's just good. I think it's important for us to have these conversations. Am I embarrassed? Yeah. Yeah, I'm embarrassed. It's hard for me to admit that to strangers because some people just don't understand. I didn't understand. I, I still don't understand. I'm learning. This is why I'm doing this book. This is why I'm reading um, cult psychology because I want to know how this happens and he he ends the paragraph by saying people's resistance is higher when they are aware of the danger it's so true so let's keep talking let's keep pushing for more education just for more awareness um you know leave comments tell me what you guys think Thanks for hanging in there um, and listening to this. I'll see you guys for the balance of chapter one. Bye.